good evening and welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. We're actually running on time tonight. Wow. What a concept. Yeah, I know my mic was up. It's okay. We're not giving away state secrets or anything. Uh, <laughs> the studio sometimes is... Uh, it's it's like walking into a labyrinth. You go, things have changed. And yet from week to week, it doesn't change a lot. So, um, does it not feel sometimes anymore like you've walked into like a surrealistic puzzle where um, the edges of reality kind of bleed in? It's almost um, like an ayahuasca experience. Well, not so much. <laughs> Um, If you look at the world right now and you look at what's happening behind the scenes, not the news that they are piping to us, you realize that the edges have begun to fray around the system. And uh, they continue to keep trying to beat more uh, potential out of this Boston incident, and there's no there there. Um, The media, uh, with their um, staging and acting cannot seem to get the American people to understand why we need to have police state, why we need to have martial law in our cities, and why we need drones in our skies. Did you know that in February, Barack Obama signed a law making it possible for police and fire departments to operate surveillance drones over U.S. skies? And under that same law, the likes of real estate agents and news organizations will soon be able to fly their own drones as well. Can I have a drone, please? Since I didn't get my jet pack, which I was promised in the 60s, um, now I want the drone. And what would I do with it? I don't know, but maybe we get to watch the watchers. My guest tonight uh, is going to actually overlap some of the interesting things that we talked about last week with uh, Jane Swagger. She is, uh, she is actually a practicing shaman. She has practiced for over 40 years. Um, Gwoda Wiyaka is a preceptor for the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and she provides instruction to medical doctors on the modern interface between shamanism and allopathic medicine. She's the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Art School, a Colorado State Certified Occupational School that trains and certifies shamanic practitioners and instructors. Uh, so what we're going to talk about tonight, first off, is going to be what happened on December 21st, 2012, and where we are now, and then we're going to kind of shift over. I want to talk about shamanism. I want to I want to get a little bit more background on the arts, the healing arts of shamanism. And with that, I introduce you to my guest, Gwilda Wiaka. Welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. Thanks for having me, Randy. It's nice to be with you. Um, your book, you have, a, you have a book out right now called So, We're Still Here, Now What? And um, that's what we're going to talk about the first hour, Gwilda, because we did a lot of shows last year on um, what we called The Shift, um, the Mayan calendar, and it was all over the map. Uh, we talked to people who represented Hopi prophecies and uh, psychics and people who were kind of mapping this. Your title seems to indicate that some people thought we might not be here right now. Is that kind of the take that you took as well from the the December 21st, 2012 um, syndrome? Yes, um, coming up to the date, and, and you know, years before, a lot of people were talking about the end of the Mayan calendar being the end of the world, and there were all sorts of, um, uh, you know, hypothesy out there. The sun was going to blow up, or who knows what, you know. Um, and uh, I um, was pretty fascinated by it and started studying the calendar itself some years back because I knew there was something more to it than it just coming to an end. And um, in the process of looking at it, I found out some really interesting things. I started writing this book long before the end of 2012. Um, so it was really fun to be able to be here. And so we're still here. We can publish the book. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out rather well, yes. It worked well for me, yeah. yes. Three-dimensional reality is good sometimes. <laughs> 
but the expectations were all over the place. Um, I had started studying the 2012 thing back probably around 2009, 2010, and commented on it in a, a, an older radio show that I did. And I honestly never expected a literal physical, I don't know what you would call it, removal from the earth. I remember interviewing Dr. Brooks Agnew, who had a very interesting hypothesis of what he called two Earths, and that there would be a merger between worlds, which I thought was an intriguing um, idea. We also have the biblical aspect of it, which was um, largely the Christian expectation of, of a rapture. And so that, to me, kind of played into it as well, because I began to see aspects of this 2012 thing as overlaying that. But... Most of the people that I talked to were expecting something less dramatic than that, but perhaps something more dramatic than what on the surface it seems we got. What really did happen on December 21st? Did anything happen? Or are we being linear in our thinking and not recognizing that we're not dealing with an event, but that we're dealing with a process? Um, well, yes and yes. Something did happen, for sure. Um, during this, this time that we find ourselves right now, there's a whole bunch of things converging, and they're actual facts, one of which is the um, Mayan calendar is, has um, uh, 12, 21, 12, left the fourth world and entered into the fifth world. And that's a, the Mayan calendar is designed around, um, actually, galactic information as to where we are relative to other heavenly bodies at any given time, much like the horoscope but much more advanced and much more um, in-depth. And that's why it's such an accurate calendar and has been such an accurate portend of what energies are bringing out what, you know, support what behavior on the planet. And the fourth world was one of greed and exploitation and polarization, with lower frequency time, which we are have been in. And the fifth world is one of unity and synergy. Um, so uh, that has, has started to take place, and that's why we're seeing the systems around us having a lot of problems. Because what we've done is we've got moved into a much higher frequency area, and here's how this looks. Um, the procession of equinoxes has brought the uh, north pole of the Earth point, pointing towards galactic center. At galactic center, matter is there's a black hole, and it's so dense, the gravity there is so dense, it pulls matter into it, anything that gets close. But then matter is ne never created, nor is it destroyed, so it's transforms it and spews it back out in gamma waves, uh, x-rays, all this stuff so it, it can still be detected from the planet. So if it can be detected from the planet, it can, you know, have an effect on the planet. Now, the north pole of our planet is where the electromagnetic field of the planet draws energies inwards and it pushes them back out at the south pole. So wherever the north pole of our planet is directed, it's really relating um, directly with the energy, and that would be the black hole right now. And at the same time, we're moving into the age of Aquarius, which is another high-frequency area, which finds itself in the photon band, which is a, high, a band of high-frequency particles that we tend to pass through. We do it um, in um, Leo and then once again in the age of Aquarius. And the age of Leo, as we were leaving it, was the age of the myths and legends of the garden. And as we were leaving it, it was the fall. So all the biblical references, all the, all the things that you were discussing, they all play in here. But we just didn't exactly read them correctly. <laughs> That's interesting that the age of Leo encompassed the garden and then the fall. The ages, do they seem to have similar characteristics in terms of the historical parallels? Are, do we have a parallel, Gilda, to the Aquarian Age? Have we been here before as a planet, as a race? Yes, we go through this. Uh, there's uh, 12 signs of the zodiac, and each of them last about um, 2,000 years. So we've moved through this photon band going into high frequency and then dropping down into low frequency. So the, the highest frequency is in Leo, and that would be the masculine high frequency, and in uh, Aquarius, which is the feminine high frequency. Then the lowest frequencies are what I call the long dark, and that's when our sun moves around into the eight and it moves out of the photon band. And it moves into the age of um, Taurus, was the last one we were in. And then on the other side, that's a more masculine imbalance, and I don't mean men, I just mean masculine. And then on the other side would be Scorpio which is the most feminine imbalance. And Scorpio and Taurus are very polarized, where uh, Leo and um, 
Aquarius are very unified because of the high frequency. The faster something moves, the closer it comes to unity. Interesting. So are we heading into a feminine age? Is Aquarius feminine? Aquarius and Leo are both balanced, but uh, okay. Aquarius tends to be a little more feminine and Leo a little more masculine. So, And the reason for that would probably be we're, when we move into Leo, we're coming out of an age of polarization in the feminine. And when we move into Aquarius, we're coming out of an age of polarization in the masculine, and therefore probably a little lean one way or the other would counterbalance. The reason I ask you that is because I've noticed a resurgence in interest in the sacred feminine. It's almost been a recurrent theme for about three years for me and other people that I interact with. And I wonder, based on what you just said, if that's not just mainly this this pull away from the strong masculine aspect with the feminine beginning to balance. Is, is that kind of the dynamic that's going on? Yes, that's one level of the dynamic, and that's mostly what we're looking at. But there are other levels that even get more mysterious. Um, in that, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman that did this amazing equation back in the 20s. And basically, it came up with the fact that uh, one cause has two initiators, one in the positive and one in the negative. And so that speaks of half, we are only living half the equation here because we only believe in matter, but actually antimatter also has an equal effect and you have to have both matter and antimatter for to create something for an event to happen a causality they called it and um so when, as we're getting aligned with galactic center on the other side of galactic center is an equal but opposite universe so there's and it's in balance in the feminine while we've been in balance in the masculine so it's a lot more dynamic going on there than, than what we can imagine but i like to just kind of keep it down to thinking about yeah we're moving into a more feminine time a more balanced time but we do have to have equal male and female balance to really create well and the feminine has been pretty much invisible for quite a while now what is the effect on us in terms of, um, I guess, first off, we have all these energies coming in, and I think a lot of people feel this. A lot of people have talked about um, things like DNA activation. Um, a lot of people are feeling very strange energies in their bodies and in their, um, their personalities, their mental processes. Uh, I, I've repeatedly had discussions with people who say they alternately feel very lethargic and very energetic. Are we pulling these energies into our bodies as part of this, this process that we're going through, Gwilda? Yes, absolutely we are. Um, and to, to describe this, if you don't mind, I have to take us to the chakra system. No um, problem. Uh, we, we have a chakra system that is recognized in the East, and but mostly the chakras that we've been uh, aware of are the ones that are anchored in the body. Um, and each of them is anchored in an endocrine gland in the body. And so that's the place between spirit and, and, and the physicality. Okay, so the endocrine gland is the physical uh, expression. The hormone that it puts off starts in a, a frequency, okay, so it's a mechanical frequency, which pushes it into electromagnetic frequency, which creates the chakric system. Each chakra itself is a toroidal field. Okay, mm -hmm. and it has to run on balanced light, masculine and feminine. So if you think of the way a toroidal field works or the way even electricity is generated, is you have to have equal measure, positive, negative, rotating around a neutral pole, a neutral center. And that, that creates, builds electricity, it builds power. So well, that's our chakric system. Now, why do we have this chakric system? Well, it's the chakric system of the human being that interacts with the quantum level. So that's how our intent is made manifest. When we moved into the long dark, we were reduced down to only the chakric systems in our body because everything became very polarized, very low frequency, very slow moving. And so that's why we think we only have seven. But actually, our chakra system goes above and below the body into infinity. The ones below the body filter in antimatter light or the feminine light. The ones above the body filter in the masculine light or matter light. Okay? Positive, negative. However, because that light hasn't been coming in, a lot of our DNA has gone to sleep, and they call it junk DNA. Well, it's not junk DNA. It's just not activated because it doesn't have the frequency required to activate it. As this light becomes available, pressure starts to build on these closed chakras. And anything that's closed, like a room that's not used, gets full of junk, unexpressed emotion, trauma, generations worth, okay? And so 
it's not like voila, the frequency raises and we all evolve. No, we have to process out the conditioning that we've lived in, the damage that we've sustained for generations in order to open up these chakras. And furthermore, we think of only higher and higher, but if we don't open them up equally above and below the body, we have imbalanced light coming in to our systems. So this is the pressure everybody is feeling. Does this explain um, the surfacing of trauma, the surfacing of... past hurts and things like that now what I what I would call loosely soul wounding and things like that because it seems like that's a recurrent that's actually been a recurrent theme on this show as well as a recurrent theme around a lot of people that I've been acquainted with Yes, that's exactly what's happening. It's like all this increased light is stirring those places that have been wounded and asleep and shut down. And just between you and me and the listeners, uh, there's been some very intentional and systematic damage and wounding to keep our frequency low enough to keep us subject to the system. And that's gone on for generations. And that's also impinged the DNA because if it's not activated, it can't be passed down very well from parent to child. And so now we have the opportunity of reversing that process, but it's a matter of choice. We can either cooperate with the process, work with the healing we need, do the things we need to do to to support our frequency on all four levels, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, or just stand here and get the chain shaken out of our pockets because the earth's going to do what she's going to (laughs) do. Yeah. Um, When you say we're talking about accumulated trauma and you're talking about generational, is that correct? I'm talking about individual and generational, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of what we're dealing with, and you also, you you added something there. A lot of this has actually been, I guess, piped out to us. In other words, there's been a concerted effort to keep us dumbed down. Is that a fair way of putting it? It absolutely is. I love to quote Einstein, and I'll probably misquote him, but bear with me. Um, Energy is matter, and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want, and you can't help but get that reality. There can be no other way. This isn't philosophy. This is physics. Okay, that's Albert Einstein. And so it stands to reason that if frequency creates reality, if you control the frequency of the masses, you control the reality. And that's been going on for generations. We're programmed through programming, the TV shows, the um, games that kids play, the food. uh, Physically, we're programmed into these addictions to artificial food and sugars and dyes and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Emotionally, we're programmed through being trained not not to feel our emotions, to stuff our emotions. So we have all these denied emotions that get jerked around them by the media. So, yeah, it's been a very concerted effort to keep the frequency of the masses below a particular level so that they remain subject to the system rather than empowered so we're dealing with that that media thing we're dealing with what what we call mass mind control trauma on a mass scale which was kind of where I was going in my little rant at the beginning of the show this idea that we're continuously being barraged with all kinds of negativity and you brought something interesting into it with the Einstein quotation because basically where I think we're going here goes into this concept of co-creation of creation as beings of of our our own our own lives and our own quote reality exactly and that's the opportunity we have here but in order to do it you know there's a lot of really great texts out there about you know the power of now and and co-creation and uh the power of attraction okay Mm -hmm. so why isn't it working well it's not working because we don't have the power we have to deprogram ourselves, raise our frequency on all four levels in order to step out of the frequency controlled by the system. When we can do that, we have a better effect at the quantum level. We've been slowed down so much frequency-wise that we don't really have any conscious connection with the quantum level. And that's what I believe shamanism is about, is an organized set of rituals designed to help the practitioner focus their ability to manage matter at the quantum level. But we have to have enough frequency on board to be able to do that. And enough consciousness on board every place we've been wounded every place we have soul damage and I don't we don't damage our soul but basically we disconnect from a natural expression our frequency is compromised and then that part is put into unconsciousness so we are creating but mostly unconsciously exactly and I remember because I'm I'm a student of the law of attraction and I know a lot of people 
got very excited about this. Um, the movie The Secret came out. This was mm -hmm. this was like a really big deal. But most of what happened was that people went back to their lives very frustrated and discouraged because they couldn't manifest. And you talked about the four levels. Again, tell us tell us those four levels. Right, and they, they all interface. We, they, uh, but basically we're looking at the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. And they all operate at a different frequency, and every person operates at a different frequency based on their natural ability and their wounding. Um, but the uh, physical vibrates at the slowest, the next is the emotional, then is the mental, and the highest frequency that we have is, is our spiritual, and then of course it goes out and beyond. But although they vibrate at different frequencies, they are all in harmony with one, other, one another in, 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 a, in a perfect world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we take damage on one level or the other, then all of a sudden it, there's a disharmony that goes on. Now, if it's a four-cylinder car <laughs> and it's got a foul spark plug, it's going to run rough until somebody fixes that spark plug. But because we're an organism, we will maintain homeostasis. So what happens is all the other levels will drop their frequency to maintain harmony at the low, with a little lower output. And that's what's happened is we've stepped down through this process, and it's a spiraling down. Now we just spiral back up by treating on all four levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. How quickly can we actually spiral up? And I ask you this because for me it felt like we started into a shift, and I, this is a kind of a rough peg, but looking back on it, for me, around 1998, I started to notice changes within myself, perceptually. Um, I started doing more serious work on a, on a spiritual level. I also began to notice traumas creeping up. I, I began to reawaken memories. I began to reawaken past hurts. There was a lot of um, a fear, a lot of violence and at the same time a lot of depression that surrounded that but I felt like I walked through this over a, probably almost a, a decade to get to where I was kind of retrieving some of my own authentic being again is this arc different for each person and is there an acceleration now in the process that we're going through on an individual and collective basis for healing I know that's a long question <laughs> That's okay. I'll give you a long answer. How's that? <laughs> Turn about fair play. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. Because, we, you know, we didn't just suddenly 12, 21, 12, bling into this energy. It's, it's a process, like you said. And it's really started amping up about that time. Um, and I've, I've noticed in, in my practice at that time, I'm able to keep my pulse on the thing, you know, my fingers on the pulse of this because I work with people spiritually all the time. Mm -hmm. And I really noticed an acceleration in people's accessing their trauma, accessing their memory starting about that time. The wonderful thing is that, and, and it is, the, the spiraling up is uh, each according to his own uh, bottom line and intention. You know, what do we want to experience and what are we willing to uh, sacrifice or heal in order to experience what we want to experience? So um, one of the fast lanes is, um, that's why I wrote the book, is soul retrieval is a spiritual um, so loss is a spiritual illness, and it's where we fragment it off from a part of our natural expression. And where we fragment it off from our natural expression, we don't have access to part of our frequency. So through uh, receiving soul retrieval healing, you can really accelerate this path. And I have on my um, website um, some uh, people that I've trained that are certified practitioners. They're long-distance practitioners. And so if people are someplace where they can't receive this healing, it is available. But it makes a huge difference. Give your um, website so address there, and we'll get it again later, too, please. I'm sorry? I said oh, my website oh, your website, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's two of them. The one I'm talking about right now is the school. It's Path Home Shamanic Art School, and uh, it's a state-certified occupational school of shamanic arts. And the website for it is findyourpathhome.com. And on that front page, you'll find a link to either classes or practitioners or whatever you want there. And then my personal website is gwildawiyaka.com, G-W-I-L-D-A-W-I-Y-A-K-A.com. And those those links are already on the page, the guest page at offplanetradio.net. They will also be posted with this audio in the archives, so you'll be able to access that as well. 
Oh, now that I derailed you. <laughs> no worries. I can still remember where I was. Good, good, good. <laughs> so w- what's happening now is we're, we're really um, accelerating, continuing to accelerate. Um, it didn't just hit a peak at 12-21-12. That's when we shifted, officially shifted from the fourth world into the fifth. But now um, our solar system continues to move into this high-frequency area. And there's a, a German scientist, I wish I could remember his name right now, but he has this beautiful article out about how all... All the planets are heating, and the um, um, uh, electromagnetic field that the sun has all around all around our solar system is heating, and uh, you know affecting the sun. It's then affecting the planets, and, and there's pole shifts on all the planets out there, and atmospheric changes, and atmospheres building where there haven't been atmospheres. So it's pretty fascinating stuff going on within our solar system, and all this is affecting us, and it continues to affect us. And I suspect in about 75 years to 100 years we will have shifted completely into, I don't think we'll really even recognize our potential at that point. But we have to personally participate with it. So here's what it looks like to me. The planet is is under a great deal of pressure. At the same time, the people on the planet are restricted to a particular frequency because of the systematic damage. There starts to be more pressure on that restriction. We need to start working from the inside to raise the frequency on the planet with the people to match the frequency that's coming at us from the outside of the planet. Oh, sorry. I had a call come in and I was... I, hey. um, if somebody in the... If you're, if you're on the uh, stream right now and you're trying to call in, please hold off and uh, I'll, I'll bring you in later. Okay. We can't take calls right now. Are you still there, Gwilda? I'm still here. Okay. Um... So on an individual level, we're really managing something that's pretty spectacular um, in terms of uh, our energies and in terms of uh, balancing ourselves. How do you approach um, on an individual level with somebody what they're going through? Is, Is this... And I know we're going to go into shamanism more on the next part of the show, but I guess we go here. The approach that the shamanistic uh, aspects take on, how do you... How do you lead somebody into a place? How do they get to that place where they recognize what they need? And then how do you identify what it is that they're going to go through in terms of the practice itself? This is... Does that make sense as a question? It it does, um, and I'll have to back up a little bit to give you the answer. Um, a uni- you know, there's shamanism at the base of all of our cultures. Right. It's, it's not okay. So it's an ancient, ancient, probably forty or fifty thousand years old, um, well before the age of Leo. It's been around. And when we are in the ages of Leo and Aquarius, it becomes it, can, it has the opportunity to become what I call galactic shamanism. Is in that it can go interstellar as well okay. as be Earth based. But when we're looking just at the Earth based on the healing level, there's this thing that everyone uses uh, that all the shamanic practices have in common, and that's known as the shamanic journey trance. And it's a um, um, measurable state of altered consciousness. The, the uh, um, alpha waves, brain waves, drop to 7.8 hertz, right down to that of the planet. Mm-hmm. And I can do it. Mm-hmm. I can teach someone to do it in uh, a day's workshop. I can do it on demand. But when we go into that trance, what we're doing is we're using our imagination as a palette to paint a metaphor of the energies interacting at the quantum level. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that's where a lot of this airy-fairy stuff comes out. Oh, the spirits told me this, and I've got bad spirits and good spirits. And No, it's really all metaphorical painting on the imagination to represent what's happening at the quantum level. And it's like an interactive dream. So I go on a shamanic journey for my client, and based on their bottom line and intent, then I'm directed to make the energy correction through soul retrieval, is what it's called. But basically, I align with the frequency that they've disconnected from. But it happens through a journey trance that has this interactive dream. And sometimes, very often, the dream will actually show the actual event where the person disconnected. And I have no way of knowing it, but they do. So it's, it's a pretty amazing process. That's that's the shamanic practice that I use most with people is is a soul retrieval practice. Now this this trance that you go into, you induce that. That's something that you are trained to do. You can basically take yourself down to that frequency, and that is what you call alpha state. Is that correct? 
Um, I'm not sure what they call it. I, like I said, I know it's the alpha brain waves that change, so maybe okay. it's what they call alpha state uh, in medicine. Um, but yeah, it's it's the alpha state that cha- alpha, alpha brain waves that change. And yes, through a technique, uh, organized set of rituals, I can do that at will, and I can train someone to do it in about in about a day's workshop. When you get that training, I don't train people to do the soul retrieval, but just to do the journey. But if you've taken the training to do the journey, then you can interact through this ritual with the uh, quantum level and see what's about to manifest in your life and find your sweet spot in it. Is this what people are? Is this what people are looking for? Is this why now there is this uptick in in the shamanic traditions where? Uh, we, we talked about this a la- last week a little bit with a guest we had on who talked about a trip to Peru and, and the ayahuasca, and, and I don't know where that fits into your spectrum, but it seems like there has been, over the last decade, this real serious swing towards moving back to shamanistic uh, earth-based practices. Yes, I think a lot of people are starting to recognize that they need more than what's going on out there. And shamanism has been around to guide people through times of change for millennia. Um, and the, with the fourth world sw- switching into the fifth, I don't know if anybody else is noticing it, but the old ways aren't working. Things are falling short. <laughs> Things aren't working as like they used to. And if you can go into a shamanic journey trance and figure out what the energy does support at this time, you can guide your life in a very different way. And so people are drawn. They're looking for answers. They're looking for answers to these questions. Um, as far as ayahuasca goes, I know that there's, um, you know, there's the good, there's the bad, and there's the ugly. There's a lot of people claiming to be shaman, and they're um, having these uh, taking people over overseas and having these great ayahuasca experiences in mass with somebody that they might be of the race, but they aren't really trained. And mm-hmm. um, and I've had to patch a lot of those people back together again. And then I myself have had uh, ayahuasca initiating experiences early on that were very profound. Found in, in my process. But what I like to do is to put people together shamanically, so bring back their essence so they can access these states through training rather than being pushed beyond their substance with a drug. These states are really natural to us. We just haven't been taught how to access them. Is that correct? Yes and no. Um, they, yes, they are natural to us. Yes, I can teach people how to access them, but the degree of our access and the accuracy of our access is dependent upon our frequency. If our frequency is way too compromised, we can't access and understand the quantum level. And that's why our shamanism has almost been eradicated on the planet, is to keep the people away from their natural ability to manage man at the quantum level, to get information about the way to work instead of being having it fed to them. So really, you are talking about something that we have discussed before, and there's many terms for it. It's been called dream time healing. That's, that's one term that one of my guests has used. Is that close to what we're talking about, of accessing this state, which, you know, if we're damaged, we can't get there, but that potential is still there. And this is why we need the shaman. The role of the shaman is to bridge us across so that we then become self-practitioners. Would that eventually be the goal? If that's a person's desire and intent, absolutely. Um, some people just want, <laughs> fix it, please, make my life work again, okay? Mm-hmm. Other people, once they start accessing, they want to explore further and further and further and become very self-actuated. So everybody has their own sweet spot within it. But um, there's so many practices coming to the fore today, that, and they're all shamanic, like psychic intrinsic, that's a shamanic skill. Divination, that's a shamanic skill. Dowsing, uh, psychics, um, you know, I could go on and on and on and on. Mediumship. There, and then you know, there's a lot of uh, modern-day practices that have been developed that are also shamanic in nature. Reiki is shamanic in nature. Um, hypnotism is shamanic in nature. Um, uh, EMDR is shamanic in nature. And so we've been striving, trying to find our spiritual feet again. Um, but it's, it's hidden in the practice, in the ancient practice. But unfortunately, the ancient practices also went through the dark ages and became dogma, just like everything else did. In polarized times, truth becomes dogmatic because we don't have access to the light anymore. So we just have to do the ritual. Now that we're coming into the light again, we can do the ritual and access the light. Is that dark aspect of that where we got things like Santeria and voodoo and things like that, which were really negative aspects of the same practices? 
Well, that's where we got people so damaged that they were drawn to those practices. There's a very fine line between shamanism and sorcery and or voodoo. And I have five, five laws that I teach my students to try to keep us from crossing that line. One is shamanism works within the laws of nature. Two, shamanism never takes energy away from someone where, some place that it does belong. Three, shamanism never puts energy on something that it doesn't belong to it. Four, shamanism never works without permission. And five, shamanism does no harm. And those five laws keep us out of sorcery, but it's amazing how easy it is to slide in there. Just even praying for somebody without their permission is putting energy on someone where it doesn't belong. So we, we have to hold to those laws because the good news about this stuff is it really works. And the bad news is it really works. And if you torque it and use it for um, like voodoo or ill gain or, you know, bending the laws of nature for your own purpose, it has a real nasty backlash. And that's the backlash the system is just about to see. Oh, do say what <laughs> that that was that was actually very titillating. Thank you. Uh, what we're about to see. Are we seeing both the dark and light at the same time with a little bit more intensity? Yes, I, these are the days the truth can't hide. And in polarized times, the light goes way polarized and the dark goes way polarized. One's luciferic and the other's satanic. Um, and the, the middle doesn't hardly exist. So it's like yeah, we're almost exactly. like bipolar. <laughs> I said this on a radio show about three years ago, and it was just one of those off-the-cuff moments where I went, you know, the contrast is getting intense. It's almost like there's no gray left. It's like the old black and white TVs. You could turn it to be real black or real white, but there, it was like the, the middle ground of those pixels all of a sudden was disappearing, and you just have this glaring contrast, and that's what I was seeing back then. Exactly. And the key is we have to come back into unity to create that neutral center so that the positive and the negative can interact again. And I think it's interesting that you say that now th things can hide. It, I, we would hope the truth wouldn't hide, but at the same time, it looks like the lies are coming to the surface, like, like dross coming off of metal. Yeah, it's amazing to watch, isn't it? Yeah. In this increased light, both masculine and feminine, um, things are exposed. <laughs> you know, shines a nasty shadow and uh, we get a chance to look at the underbelly of what's been going on is that kind of what the shamanistic process is like too do people that you work with do they go through some of that contrast as well um, people that I work with are already experiencing that contrast and my job is to help them find that that's the case and then fill in the parts of them to where they can find unity. So there's, there's nothing wrong with the dark side of us or the light side of us, but they need to interact so that we can be whole beings and be in unified energy because that's the energy that's being supported right now. And that was kind of another thing I wanted to ask you about. We're, we've moved out of this, we've moved out of this age now or we're moving out of this age our spirituality was tied for so long, certainly for the last 1900 years, to what I believe in your book you refer to as dogma, where we had an organized religious system that told us this was good and this was bad. These were the practices that you followed, and you went this way and no further. Is are we are we now moving out of that, and is that some of the the cultural shock as well that we're experiencing? Yes, and I, I think at this point I really need to kind of clarify one thing for, for myself, and that is none of these frequencies are wrong, and at any given age, all of them have to be in existence for reality to be in mm -hmm. existence. Mm -hmm. I agree. So it's like we have to have each of these frequencies, uh, each rung of a ladder to build a ladder. So like in the age of Pisces, Christ was born, but also in the age of Pisces, Hitler was born. So it's like, you know, there's, there's about the good and the bad, the ugly of it, okay? So um, each person on the planet at any given time is going to choose where they, based on their intent and bottom line, want to be working, want to be operating, want to be vibrating. 
And so, but now that we're moving into the fifth world, we're moving into a time of more unity. And dogma just doesn't fill the bill anymore. When we were in the long dark, when we didn't have enough light to see by, we needed some kind of a stability, some kind of a guidance. And all we had left were shamanic rituals or dogmatic religion. Thank goodness it was there. But now we're moving out and it can once again expand into its true glory. Is there a movement that's kind of bridging between the two schools, um, the dogmatic school and the more natural earth-based shamanistic practices? Are you seeing, for instance, where um, people are coming out of a religious system and kind of moving towards the dynamics of what you teach and what you practice? I see that, but I also have students and clients that are absolute devout Christians. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it, so what I actually see happening is I think that, you know, shamanism is originally designed to take care of the, spir- the um, spiritual health of people. And I don't mean moral health. I mean spiritual health, the frequency, and manage the quantum level, keep their frequencies healthy. Uh, religion was designed to help with the moral health of the people. They both had their purposes. They both, they both are beautiful practices. But they both went through the long dark, and both of them became equally dogmatic. So now what I see happening is not only is shamanism has the opportunity to move back into galactic shamanism, and religion has the opportunity to move back into spirituality, um, but also they have the, the opportunity to merge, just like I see shamanism and science merging. In your trance state, do you receive very specific information if you have a client that you're working with if I was consulting with you would you receive specific information about my situation and would it come in symbolic form would it be very explicit I know you touched on this but I'm curious to know more about the trance state as a practitioner how you see things what you hear what the experience is sure um so, first, again, I have to back up. This practice works. I always make sure that my clients understand that they need to figure out what the bottom line is that they want to stick by. In other words, at this time in their life, what do they and do they not want to experience? That's what I call a bottom line. Then within the, in that, they need to have an intention. Okay, I'd like to heal this, or I'd like to heal this relationship, or I'd like to move beyond this restriction. Okay? So once they have that established, then when I go into the shamanic journey trance, I'm literally journeying into their space. And all I see is based on what they intend to work on, not everything that goes on with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm allowed to afford them their privacy. Within that, some of what I see in in the dream state, you know, the interactive dream or the shamanic journey, is um, metaphorical. Some of it is absolutely factual and literal, but because it's their life and not mine, I don't know which is which. So, one time I saw, I was journeying for a lady, and I saw a little girl sitting in the driveway, pounding over and over and over on this pound of pegboard. And it was clearly a homemade one, and I described it right down to the colors and everything about it. And when I came out of the journey, I, I, I speak out loud in my, when I'm doing journey for people. When I came out of the journey, she was absolutely pale, and she had tears in her eyes. I said, what? I said, I, I, I have to look up pound of pegboard. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and she said, no. I was sitting in the driveway. My father made me that pound of pegboard for Christmas. I was waiting for him to come home, but he had been killed in a car accident. And I went out and played with that toy in the driveway waiting for him every day for weeks on end. Mm. Yeah, that's that's pretty impactful. Um, so in that case, there was no interpretation necessary. It was quite literal. Do you deal with people who have what I would call the extreme end of trauma, people who have been subjected to any type of traumatic mind control or things like that? Oh, yeah. I could tell you things make your socks roll up and down. And that's how I stumbled on is through my practice to what's actually going on out there and has been. I've seen people that have been ritualistically abused. I've seen people that have been programmed. I've seen people, you know, from childhood on, sexually abused, and it goes on and on and on and on. I've seen people that have been abducted, and I go into the journey and I see the abduction. Um, I mean, physically abducted. I've never experienced that personally, but I've seen it in journey. Is it a metaphor? Is it real? It felt pretty real to them. So there's a lot going on out there in the in the quantum level and in this society that's systematically and intentionally damaging people to keep our frequency below a certain level. Is there a, a dark spiritual aspect to 
these extreme edges of things. I mean, are, are we... One of the things that I've struggled with, Gwilda, is this interplay between dark and light, good and evil. And as you pointed out earlier, that is all part of this present dimensional system that we live in. We live in a world of contrast, so we kind of play back and forth between that. But is there an overarching evil that you would call uh, supernatural that comes into play in all of this that is a force that moves upon us um, I would I would reframe that a little bit okay. uh, to answer it but um, well, this is going to seem like it's not related but it is okay so we all have parasites in our body at one time or another right right there's energetic I mean there's physical parasites out there all the time you might right. get a leech or you might get a worm or you know a mosquito or whatever but there's you know there they are right they aren't necessarily evil but we sure as heck don't want them feeding on us right well, as above, so below. There's parasitical, because we're coming out of the fourth world of parasitical existence, there's parasitical beings at the energetic level, just like there is at the physical level. And these things feed off of trauma and fear and pain, okay? Yes. And so yeah. they, uh, um, there's this whole operating system going on, just like if I have a tapeworm, that little booger puts out a chemical and puts it into my bowel that makes me crave the very things that it needs to eat. This is the medical fact. Okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. And so these energetic ones also are able to make us crave or behave in ways that feed them, i.e. traumatize each other, go off, off you know, yell at somebody, whatever. And so we, we look at that as evil. Well, it's, it's uh, something we don't want to be subject to. That's fact. But if our frequency is high enough, if my immune system is high enough, the tapeworm is going to get ousted. And if our frequency is high enough and our energetic immune system is high enough, these things can't have a whole sway over us. So again, it's all a matter of wholeness. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I remember going to a Reiki practitioner maybe about a year and a half ago, and she told me that I had a parasite in one of my chakras. And she worked on it for quite a while. And I I remember at some point where she broke through and what I felt at that moment, it was like an emotional um, clearing occurred. It was it was it was almost like I wasn't aware of it at the time. But when she worked on me and inform me what she was doing then I began to understand that there was something there I couldn't identify it is that what we're talking about? yes that's one example absolutely it is Mm -hmm. and so this is kind of the things that people are going through in their daily lives and a lot of people really don't know what's wrong with them they know something's wrong but we've also been kind of trained to ignore our own trauma haven't we? Yes, we have to because it's so overwhelming. The, the, one of the things that we're dealing with right now is our pain bodies are being activated, and it's absolutely overwhelming. If we don't systematically heal that damage, and of course if you've got a drumstick, everything looks like a drum, but I feel through soul retrieval is one of the keys here. If we don't systematically heal that damage, um, then we have this huge unprocessed pain body that's getting rattled loose because of the high frequency. I... Uh... <laughs> This is really interesting because I'm kind of almost going through a gestalt while you're talking about this, recognizing that a lot of this, you know, I can't help but think that people here at the show are going to begin to recognize some of what they're going through as well. We deal a lot with people that have been through trauma, and a lot of people out there are looking for solutions. There's... uh, There's people that have spent years in anguish and pain over things that have happened to them, and they don't seem to get a lot of of relief from traditional therapy anymore, psychotherapy or or things like that. Um, and And I guess what I'm saying right now is that there's people in the chat right now, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. And I'm also going to open up. uh, I know we had a caller earlier, so if you want to call back in at this point, we'll take your call. And uh, so I, I kind of moved off of the, the, the 2012 thing a little bit. But what we talked about kind of funnels back into all of this. Now we've passed this, 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 this point in time. And I know that some people were projecting that the, um, 
the spring equinox probably was going to be a time again of some more shifting and changing. Did we experience that as well? Yes, we sure do. Uh, what I see going on right now, and a lot of it is beautifully charted by uh, a good astrologer because because of all the stuff that's going on out there planetary-wise in addition to what our whole solar system is doing moving through the galaxy. But this this, this increase is, uh, is manifesting like everything else in life. You know, a rose doesn't bloom, just, just open up. It pulses into blooming. The ocean pulses against the shore. A woman pulses in, in childbirth. And like Likewise, these uh, high frequencies are pulsing. There's times of greater intensity, and then it contracts back, and then greater intensity, and it, it contracts back. And so uh, riding the currents is key here, but it's not the way we ever learn to do it. That's why it's so important to be able to read nature, to become more earth-based, to get a shamanic skill or have someone around you that has one so that you can read what's being supported and what's absolutely not. If we are are in the shift collectively, is, do the same dynamics apply as a planet? Uh, we have a whole planet, you know, supposedly six billion people that are going through this, and people are all on different scales. Does your practice or the practices of other shaman type people support something that's going to ripple out into the general population? We talk about the shift. We're talking about something that's going on globally. How does this impact the planet and the populace? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, for that, we're going to talk about sound, okay? <laughs> if you're in a Yes, sound you're chamber, a musician, right? Uh, well, yes, I am, actually. Yeah, I am. Um, if, if you're in a sound chamber, and you sound, because the sound is just another, another frequency of vibration. So, you're in a sound chamber, and you sound a note, and it has a, a particular wavelength. If you sound a note identical volume with the exact opposite wavelength, instead of double volume, you get total silence because they cancel each other out. If right. you're in a sound chamber and you sound a sound wave at a particular volume, and then you sound an identical sound wave at the same volume, it, it, the volume increases well more than twice. Exactly. And that's the theory behind the hundredth monkey. If, shamanically speaking, if we can heal ourselves and each other enough to raise the frequency of a number of people, then there's this frequency increase that's going to shatter that frequency ceiling that all the damage has us underneath. Once that's happened, once we pierce that veil, then the path is laid for others. And we're in the process of doing that. So there's a ripple out effect that occurs. Yes, there is. Yeah, I understood the principles you were talking about, especially noise cancellation, because obviously I do audio engineering, and that's that's a <laughs> that's a big thing, and you yeah. know that too. Uh, if you've been in a studio, you understand all of that. And these these are all principles that move out of engineering and and into the energy field. I have a question on the chat room, and it is, uh, where did the shamanic practices originally come from? Well, it seems how they're over 50,000 years old or 40,000 or 50,000. I don't know for sure. Um, I think that they've been around as, as long as people have, really. Um, and like I said, when we're in the greater light, I, I think that's where they developed. I also believe that the pyramids were built shamanically, that the Mayan calendar was built shamanically. They, um, they, the Mayans were, the priests were both mathematicians and shaman. Um, so, it, like I said, it's been around since forever. It's just taken different faces over the ages. And somebody else in the chat room has just asked, uh, what should we do? How do we move ahead? Um, that's a pretty general question, but it came across about the same time we were talking about the trauma issue. So is there anything you, you could address in terms of, of how people would, would move ahead in, in, in going into healing? You bet. The um, other part of my title of my book is Spiritual Evolution and Personal Empowerment in a New Era. And that's what the book is about, is how we as individuals can use some basic tools to treat ourselves on the physical, mental, and uh, emotional, and spiritual level in order to raise our frequency. And the beauty of it is nobody has to give up something that they really, really love. 
Okay. If I like drinking wine, I can still drink wine. Maybe I want to choose organic wine instead of something with chemicals in it. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, there's all of these all of these things can be addressed according to your uh, intent and lifestyle. But there's all sorts of tools that we can use. But the key is we have to treat on all four levels, and then continue to spiral up with treatment on all four levels each time we get another wave of this high frequency because it's going to bring more stuff up. Okay, hope that answers the question on the chat. And you may want to be a little more specific. Um, that it would help a lot if we know what we're dealing with. Um, some of the people who who listen to this show are dealing with some pretty intense issues of abuse and trauma. And we have people who have had abduction scenarios and people who are, quite frankly, physically completely impacted by their experiences the physical healing side of this and and this kind of goes maybe a a little more in depth our physical our physical body is is impacted by all these other levels so the things that we experience physically must have some cause does shamanism deal with um, physical healing by the same process that it does uh, emotionally and spiritually um, it, it, it's all based on the, the practitioner and the degree of skill and what their aptitude is. But yes, um, I'm in a preceptor for, like we said, for the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I teach doctors the interface between uh, shamanism and allopathic medicine. And I've been working with um, numerous medical doctors for, oh, for 20 years. Um, interfacing back and forth and um, I can work as a medical intuitive and I'm, I'm substantiated by MRIs um, and one case do you want me to tell you about a case that, that's sure. an example yeah, of this? Please. Okay. Yeah, would be great. Um, th- I had a, doc- a doctor friend of mine he and I referred patients back and forth and I worked out of his office and he used me for uh, medical intuitive quite a lot and um, he gave me a call and I thought he was calling to refer another patient to me but actually he'd had a heart transplant a uh, val- heart valve transplant and he was it was failing he was miserable and he was under trauma and he was having rejection symptoms and so he came in to me for a personal session so I went into what um, we described as a shamanic journey and what I, where I was taken was what we would call a middle world journey but across time and space so back into the past into the operating room where he had the surgery and what I was shown is um, they had him on, uh, they had him, you know, his chest was open and they had him on an artificial heart running his heart while they're doing the surgery. And they take his uh, heart valve out, the faulty heart valve out. And I was instructed by spirit to take his essence out of that heart valve before they took it off, which I did. Then they brought in the donor's heart valve. And I was instructed to... Um, remove the donor's energy from the donor's heart valve and take it to the other side where the donor obviously was. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I connected with that energy, I suddenly saw this big Mack truck heading right at me. And I I woke up to see this. So I felt like I'd fallen asleep at the wheel and I woke up with this big truck coming at me. And that was just this horrible trauma and that was the, the lights went out basically. So this trauma was still in the heart valve of the donor. I took that out of the uh, donor's heart valve and I put the doctor's essence into the new heart valve and then they continued with the surgery Um, when I came back from the journey okay um, then I I told him what had happened I I said I I don't know this is what I was shown that I was supposed to do the rejection stopped immediately and he had this area over his heart that was just like uh, totally not aligned with his whole body. He could tell it was very painful, his, it hurt, he was in trauma all the time and that went away the day of the, of the treatment and then the heart rejection stopped and he's actually uh, wrote me just recently, he's wrote a, what he calls his Gwilda stories because um, I probably just <laughs> asked for some of his stories and that's one of them that he wrote about. He really feels that I saved his life and he recommends this sort of treatment to help with organ rejection. That's actually pretty interesting given what we know about the heart and the fact that the heart itself uh, is so central uh, as, as conducting between the mind and the soul and the spirit. There's actually um, brain tissue in the heart itself, which means that it functions dualistically as, as an organ. And I, I've read articles about people who have 
uh, had heart transplants and uh, taken on different personality aspects or had cravings for food they never liked. It, it sounds like um, a lot of times when they do these operations, that aspect of it isn't really present in medicine. And so you kind of you're kind of providing that spiritual interface in this particular kind of procedure, aren't you? Yes, I am, and I work with veterinarians as well. And one veterinarian called me in because he had a, a very rare opportunity, and he he was he was a great vet, and he used uh, arthroscopic surgery to do spays, and he would just remove the uh, ovaries instead of the whole enchilada, so it was much less traumatic for the animal. But the opportunity he had is he had um, two female pups from the same litter that were in to be spayed at the same time, okay, from the breeder. And so he had me come in, and he um, let me work with, with one, but not with the other. So that way he had, what do you call that, a, a blind study, if you will, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And so the, um, when he, there's a medication they give the animals before, before they give them the general that calms them down, but they always get sick to their stomach on it. And he told me as much, and I said, well, may I, may I work with the medicines? And he had them all laid out on a tray. So I put one hand on the dog, and I put my hand over the medicines, and I attuned the medicines frequency-wise so that they would do what they needed to do for the dog but still be in balance, as much balance as possible with the dog. He gave that dog the first injection, and she got all woozy and staggered around, but she never vomited. Then when they gave her the general, um, she, you know, and operated on her. I was in the operating room. And when they removed her ovary, I pulled her energy out of the ovary and put it back into her body. And when they stitched her back up, I pulled the trauma out of the tissues and uh, returned the original frequency of her tissues. Um, then um, when the other dog was done with her surgery, um, he did both of them. The first dog came out, and, you know, dogs usually yipe and ki and swim, they call it, when they're coming out of anesthetic. Uh, she simply stood up, shook her head, and was fine. And the other one was crying and, and churning and like they normally do. The healing process is what was particularly amazing. The first dog, the one that I was able to aid, healed three times as fast as her sister. Mm, interesting. Wow. So this works with, uh, with the beasts of our planet as well. Yes, it does. Amazing. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna take a break at this point. Uh, play some music. <clears throat> let everybody get a chance to take a, a a break and stand up, walk around, get some oxygen, a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you're drinking, and uh, we'll come back with my guest, Grota Wiaka. We'll be here, and we're gonna go into uh, a little bit more about shamanistic practices and your questions and phone calls as well. As we come back on the other side of Off Planet Radio Live, we will be back in about, um, well, three to eight minutes or so. How's that sound? We'll be right back. I'm Randy Boggins. Second hour of Off Planet Radio Live for May 8th, 2013. I'm Randy Moggins, and this is Off Planet Radio Live at offplanetradio.net. The home website is offplanetradio.com, 
and uh, <laughs> we are working to consolidate things on a on another level uh, with websites and things like that. There's been a lot of problems, but at the same time, things are still kind of functioning. So. Um, yeah, that's going to happen in a few months as well. What's going to happen next week is going to be fun. Um, Chris Holly will be joining me as co-host, and I need I want to welcome Chris for um, basically coming on board. Uh, it's kind of been a hope of mine for a long time to have other people involved with this, and uh, the chemistry is good. And Chris brings to the table perspectives and uh, an energy that's uniquely hers. Uh, those of you who have heard her and know her background and have uh, read her work know that she is a dedicated researcher into the field of paranormal. And um, it's going to be a very exciting time as well. So next week, May 15th, Chris Holly with as co-host. And our special guest is going to be Ken Pfeiffer. Uh, I believe he's the director of New Jersey MUFON. In addition, he hosts uh, two websites. The main one is worldufophotos.org, and he's been documenting photographically the UFO phenomena. So that's going to happen next week. Two weeks from now, May 22nd, Denise Stoner and Kathleen Marden will be here. And um, uh, Kathleen Marden is actually the niece of uh, Betty Hill, of the Betty and Barney Hill abductions back in the 70s. And this book kind of brings together a whole lot of uh, data about alien abductees. So um, that's going to be a, a, a pretty ripping show as well. And Chris will be back on May 29th with co-host uh, Kate Valentine, who is a UFO investigator and radio talk show host. So that's the lineup for the month of May. My guest for this show tonight for two hours is a, a shamanistic practitioner, among other things. She is a trainer as well in shamanistic practices. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, welcome back for the second hour. Go to Weaka. Well, thank you, Randy. Uh, you... Um, <laughs> You brought up some something interesting, and I wanted to, I wanted to go into a little bit more your interface with uh, traditional medicine, uh, specifically allopathic practitioners, and your work as um, uh, I forget the exact term now that you use um, at the at the University of Colorado. Uh, how you interface with these these medical professionals. The, the term for that and what exactly you do. Oh, I'm a preceptor for for the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and um, that means that um, they have a, a alternative medical class that they that I uh, train doctors in the interface between shamanism and allopathic medicine. So it's it's really an exciting thing to have happening because um, it's just one more sign of unity happening and people opening their minds and opening their hearts and coming together to best treat our people. How how is that received? Um, I, and, and I know this because I have known a fair amount of physicians. I actually have a brother who's a surgeon. How is that received by people who are going through the kind of training that traditional medical doctors go through? Well, I swear that tra training for traditional medical doctors is one systematic fragmentation yes, after another. Yes, exactly. No, it is trauma. <laughs> it is trauma on a mass it is scale. It's dramatic. Yes. I mean, these poor people, they come in, their adrenals are fried. I mean, I get to do medical intuitive on them too, as a demonstration, and I'm going, oh, man, they're all stressed out to the max. But... Um, each according to his gifts, but I'm really seeing more and more openness among the young doctors coming on. Um, one of the doctors that I've interfaced with for 20 years is actually um, one of the uh, instructors, clinical instructors at that university, and he's been having me see his, his medical students for, well, the last 20 years. He has four of them shadow him a year, and he sends them to me for a session so that they can experience the work firsthand. Um, so, you know, he's... Um, uh, specializes in uh, he's a he's a family doctor but he specializes in holistic practice as a holistic practitioner and that's how we met was we were working out of the same clinic um, at one point so 
I, you know, I'm kind of in the mecca for that because I'm only, you know, an hour out of Boulder, less than an hour out of Boulder, Colorado. Oh, really? so, cool. Yeah, so yeah. I'm kind of in the mecca for holistic. But if it's starting here, it's again that hundreds monkey thing, that that frequency, um, it's going to expand. And just you know, the problem with any medicine is if it is it's left to treat everything. We need to come together so that we can support all four levels of our being equally. The reason shamanism seems to seem so magical to people is, you know, we've really worked hard on the physical level. We've really worked hard on the mental level. We've really worked hard on the emotional level. And then we're feeling out because we haven't treated the spiritual level or the intera- uh, quantum interaction with things. And if we start getting that piece in there, all the others can then start to move again and the whole process can evolve to better health for everyone. Do you interface at all with um, uh, psychological professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists, people like that? You bet. You bet. In fact, I had a psychiatrist who graduated from my school. Um, so, and I've had engineers graduate from my school. It's a two-year program. It's quite extensive. So, yes, I do. And um, sometimes people will come to me. You have to have a certain amount of um, stability to process this kind of trauma. And sometimes people will come to me, and they really need to be stabilized emotionally before they can engage in shamanic healing. And so we interface back and forth. And then the, the therapist, sometimes their clients will get stuck in therapy, and they know that that means, well, we need to access another frequency for them so they can process out at another level. I, I find this really exciting. And when I read your bio, I went, I wasn't aware, and obviously this is not across the board yet, but I wasn't aware that there was an interface going on between, I guess, what we would call uh, the old old ways and modern medicine. But it, it makes a lot of sense. We're, if you look at our healthcare system now, and I, I don't see it getting better as a result of uh, of the healthcare system that you know the reform that's going on. It's a mess. And we've treated everything the same way, uh, basically using using chemicals, using um, the forms of medicine that that have have grown out of uh, the the anatomical studies, but never really dealing with um, things on the level that you would deal with them. The acceptance of this, would it be, for instance, uh, reasonable to assume that in, in years ahead we will begin to see it mainstreamed into the system? I sure hope so, because it's such a key. Um, I mean, this practice hasn't been around for 40 or 50,000 years without having some, some kind of benefit for people. Um, but I always joke around, I say, you can't shovel poop with a feather. When our frequency gets so low, we need artificial chemicals to boost it, to get it moving. But the problem is, the Food and Drug Administration and all of the, the practices are so coarse that they maintain a coarse frequency. Sometimes, you know, you if you balance your brain chemistry, then you can process the shamanic healing and then get off the drugs, you know. So they really need to work together because just chasing symptoms around with chemicals is just a low frequency. It's not helping. And the only ones benefiting are the food and drug industries. One of the things that's going to impact that, and I don't want to go off on a whole thing about this, but I'm interested in this, is... um, Medicine is now driven by the insurance companies, as you well know. Is there currently anything on the horizon that will bring this acceptance to the mindset of people who run insurance companies who basically do run the medical industry? Well, yeah, it was a sad thing. But doctors are out there busy trying to save lives, and the the insurance companies took over medical practice. Um, and, you know, I, to answer that question, I have to go back into a part of my book. It's called Smoke and Mirrors. And it talks about how the single pyramid system has developed throughout the long dark with the patriarchal imbalance that was going on. Um, and that's not to say in the long dark over in Scorpio. It's a matriarchal imbalance, and it's a single pyramid the other direction. But the pyramid structures run like so. At the bottom of the pyramid are well-meaning people wanting to put in a good day's work for an honest pay, and they try to deal honestly with each other. There's very little wealth and very little information spread among many. And then as you step up the pyramid higher and higher and higher, you have, you know, managers and supervisors, and they have more information and uh, more money. 
until mm-hmm. you finally so you finally get to the very top of the pyramid where is the all seeing eye where there's much wealth and much information spread among very few and that's the system that's developed in just about all of our industries I'm not just picking on the insurance company industry but the bottom line is the bottom line is the dollar Okay, they don't, you know, at the top, they don't really care about the people on the bottom of the pyramid, nor do they care about the people that they're treating. All they want to know is how little treatment they can get away with giving a person in exchange for the insurance money and how they can control the system to do just that. It's, um, you know, it's pretty scary that that's what's running our health care system. And it's simply the result of the frequency that we've been under, not that there's any villains out there. And the people that you talk to at the bottom of the pyramid, they're, well, I'm just talking to my, my insurance lady the other day, lovely lady. She's just trying to help me. She really is, genuinely. And, and, but it's just the system has gotten to where it's pretty corrupt at the top. And, you know, the amount of money they have to invest every hour on premiums that they haven't paid people just to keep from losing money. If they delay paying those premiums to people, they're making trillions of dollars every hour on money that they, that's owed. So it's, it's a nasty, nasty situation. But the beauty, beauty of it is we're moving into a time when the single pyramidal structure imbalanced, polarized structure is not going to stand much longer. We're moving into a time that does not support that format. So it's going to shake apart. I really hope so. And I I actually see that, but I see that we have to go through the implosion of the system as well, which is, I think, part of this whole shift thing. It's ironic that even as we're struggling to get back to a system that would be more favorable towards the spiritual side of things we are still vertically integrated we're still bringing online systems that are corporatized and vertically integrated rather than the organic aspects of of what you do what you do is not vertically integrated it is it is more lateral in terms of how it operates is that is that a fair way to characterize that it really is, and the beauty of it is it's it's all uh, represented in nature. Nature never went into that pyramidal thing. Nature just stayed nature, and that's why shamanism is so earth-based and, and, and synergistic in its way. I mean, I like to use the example, I go out and I sit underneath my tree, and it ex- exhales carbon dioxide, and I exhale oxygen. I mean, I, 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 it exhales oxygen, and I exhale carbon dioxide, and there's this beautiful synergistic thing going on. Mm-hmm. But I didn't go out there and, and, and strike up a deal with the tree. It's just by our very nature that we're that way. Right. And as each of us returns to our true nature by reclaiming our frequency and reclaiming our birthright, the system can't prevail over us. We don't have to fight it. We just don't participate energetically. The thing I like to, the example I like to give is there was this wonderful experiment, and I, I think I got the people surprised for it. I saw it when I was in college, and I won't tell you how long ago that was. But he took a, 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 a tra- sound again. He took a bowl, a tray, or a plate of sand. And he blasted it with a frequency mm-hmm. in the sound room. Mm-hmm. And as you'd expect, the sand just started jumping around like crazy. Chaos, right? Right. But then, after a little while, it set into this beautiful kaleidoscope repeating pattern. Very intricate and very precise, and that pattern held as long as that note held. But when they changed the note from one note to another, the sand went into total chaos again for a while. And then another totally unique, repeating, intricate pattern formed in the sand. What's happening here is we've gone from the tone of the fourth world and moved into the tone of the fifth world. So the old formats are starting to shake apart because they're not supported anymore. But what is supported is the new format, and that's unity in synergy. That's actually a really cool metaphor, and it's interesting that you would bring that up because I've just been... uh, I I do another show with a group for uh, Global Energy Movement, and we were talking about the fact that they've discovered that um, rocks and sand and things like that are actually discharging energy themselves. So it's interesting to see how nature itself is modeling things for us on kind of a micro level that we can then begin to utilize and scale up. Um, There's a lot of parallels between what we're talking about here and what people are looking at in alternative energy as well because we can't operate by the same paradigm anymore. We have to scale in another direction which is not, as we've discussed, linear and vertically integrated. 
Exactly, and it goes back to that perpetual motion of the uh, potential of a toroidal field. And if you consider each of our chakras as a toroidal field, a, a negative and a positive spinning around a neutral, uh, and, and, and if you have equal light and dark, equal positive and negative, spinning around neutral, heart, love, then you have perpetual motion. That, that fuels everything. Everything expresses according to a toroidal field, from a rock to a planet. Our electromagnetic field around the planet is a toroidal field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, if we build energy that's based on that principle, it's going to be supported by the toroidal field of the planet. And rather than raking, um, you know, sorcery, which is basically torquing the laws of nature, you work within the laws of nature. And that's definitely what's going to be supported in our future. I'm going to shift here a little bit to a separate subject, and and it's interesting... Uh, synchronistically what happened here because I had a thought on the break <clears throat> I pulled up a quote from your book and then somebody in the chat room posted something that was kind of lined right up with this so and I'll read this quote from your book it says I am a shadow walker by nature Scorpio by sign woman by gender and shaman by trade death and life are my business um one of the things that I was thinking about, and I don't know why my brain just goes in these places, has to do with shamanism and dealing with death. The question in the chat room basically said this. It's wild to think if we went down that road, we would eventually be learning to traverse death, right? And that would be the Egyptian science, sciences they did over 3,000 years. Makes me wonder who is actually more advanced, us or them. I want to bring it back to this idea of traversing death and how shamanistic practices themselves come into focus for people who are preparing to transition. Oh, that's that's a beautiful subject. Um, and well, remind me to dance with the Egyptian piece and all that in a little bit. But let's just go right into what we call psychopomp work. Um, I've done it for hospice. I did it for my mother. I've done it for various ones, and it's one of the, the skills that I train at the higher levels in the mm-hmm. school. And psychopomp is basically helping the dead to cross. Um, and um, what death is, <laughs> this is, this, there's a lot more to it than this, but there's a frequency below uh, which we cannot maintain physical health. And there's a frequency above which we cannot maintain a physical body. And so when the body drops to a place below which, for whatever reason, injury, trauma, age, um, that we can no longer maintain the frequency to hold physical health, and it starts to drop below a frequency that can contain our our spirit or our um, a spectrum of frequency that is who we are at this at this divination. Then we start to leave the body, and when we leave the body, some of our energy has been fueling the body. So we start climbing back up through these frequencies that we have systematically fragmented off from throughout our lifetime, and that's why you have the phenomenon of a life, per, person's life passing before their eyes when they get ready to die. But as a shamanic practitioner, my job as a psychopomp is to help the person find the frequency of unity on the other side, basically. Mm-hmm. And because we have been systematically fragmented as human beings so, for so long, a lot of people without that help cannot find the way to the frequency of unity and get stuck here in the bardo or in what they, the Catholics might call purgatory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of disembodied spirits that are out there in, still within our frequency ceiling that are being fed on and tortured all the time. Yes, and they're yes. parts of people that are actually alive. <laughs> so another part of the cycle pump in, in, the, in the future is to help that spirit gather all of its parts that it can, raise its frequency on the way out, and then help it to cross to unity. I've, uh, I've experienced this personally on two different levels, and one of them was the death of my own mother. And in that particular case, um, there was there was closure, there was resolution. And as she passed, and after the time she passed, we actually communicated with each other. And it was really <laughs> quite one of the most amazing moments of my life because shortly after she passed, it was in January here, um, it just started to gently snow. And I walked outside and just... Uh, I was in nature, I was in a place where I was comfortable, I felt connected, and uh, I I didn't feel a lot of grief, but I had that moment when I felt her presence touch me, and then there was that departure. And 
the other side of this contrastingly was the death of a young person who was very close to my family who was in distress after his death for a while and thanks to the help of some friends of mine we were able to help him transition over he was distressed uh, over it and did not move into uh, cross over and um Again, you know, there was a good outcome, but both of these were very different. But they presented, I guess, the context for the question that I asked you, because as a culture, we don't really deal with death gracefully. We have, again, a system for dealing with this. And while many cultures do have a way of celebrating life and death, in general, in our culture, death is viewed as a negative, and it is something that... I think, under the surface, most people don't want to deal with it. Well, exactly, because we're taught to fear it because we have been so fragmented we can't access the spiritual realm. I can go talk to my mother anytime I choose, even though she's crossed, because through shamanic practice and through my personal healing, I have that much energy mobility that I can go to the frequency where her personality if you would would uh, resides Mm -hmm. um when i when i go on journey work i have power animals and helping spirits that help me uh which is metaphors for energies that are helping me with these journeys but also my dog that's already crossed shows up to help so it's like we are a community of frequency and we've differentiated to become incarnate but to fear going back to that unity we can dance wherever we want to I really see a day when when we can drop our robes here, if you will, transport our consciousness through the X points created. uh, I'll tell you about X points if you're interested, if you haven't already heard. I'm very interested in this, yes. Uh Uh-huh, you're going to love this. And then gather up our consciousness on another planet and gather the minerals and things around us to recreate our bodies. This is what biolocation is built about. There's myths and legends about this all the time. And so now that we're coming into a time of higher frequency, that's when galactic shamanism is becoming available. So not only am I an Earth-based practice... I was going to ask you to explain this. Thank you. So go ahead Uh and go there because this is very interesting to me. Okay, great. So shamanism is an an Earth-based practice, but the Earth is in space. And, you know, there's a lot going on here. And as above, so below. So one of the things that my practice is spread out into is working galactically in that for a while I I would be called to to go visit with some beings and I didn't know who or what they were but they were you know they met me in middle world I mean lower world so I knew that they were on the uppity up they were good ones they were evolved ones and they had some intel and some help and we were exchanging information and every time I go to them it was the strangest thing in my journey I thought was a metaphor I would cross through these X's and go to our sun and then from the sun I would cross through more X's and go to galactic center and then from there I'd cross through some more X's and go to another sun and cross his and more X's and go to a planet and commune with the beings there. Well, I just thought this was all metaphor to get information to me, right? Because we talked about how the shamanic uh, journey is metaphor to get information. Mm -hmm. Then I saw this film from NASA that talked about X points. And it says, okay, there's the electromagnetic field of the Earth, and it's a toroidal field around the Earth. There's electromagnetic field of the Sun, toroidal field around the Sun and around our our, um, solar system. When those two electromagnetic fields cross, they create what they were calling X-points. But dig this. Those X-points are actually wormholes. Mm. And NASA that, has all these little probes out there trying to figure out how to take, make use of those wormholes because they shorten the distance between, you know, they, they warp time and space. Yes, yes. This is exactly so, how... So, I go, go ahead. Go for it. This is beautiful. So, so, it's fun. so galactic shamanism is the projection, if you have enough frequency and enough uh, uh, mastery of the practice, is you can not only work with the earth-based spirits, but you can project your awareness through your intent, through excellence. You don't have to know which ones they are because your intent drives it to commune with beings on other worlds I'm thinking that these X points are also toroidal fields are they yes they do they create toroidal fields that would have been been my expectation that would be the wormhole yes exactly (laughs) yeah yeah this is interesting because it crosses over into a lot of the research that uh, we've done on extraterrestrial life, the um, I guess what you, what, what you would call the investigation in ETs and life on other planets, and what's going on outside of uh, our own 
world right now. And so there's just amazing overlaps that occur when you, you bring this information out. Uh, the idea of intergalactic shamanism is an amazing concept. It leads me into another area I want to talk to you a little bit about, and it has to do with um, what I guess we call reincarnation. I really dislike the term anymore, but I I recognize the fact that it's a valid concept on some level. Do you deal with people in terms of what I guess we'll call past life type aspects? Yes, I don't intentionally like do past life regression particularly. And I think I think that there's very much we don't understand about past life. But right. very often in shamanic healing sessions, I'm taken to a past life where some major trauma took place. So, but now get this picture. We don't all operate the same in that. Remember that frequency ceiling I mentioned because of all of our fragmentation as a yeah. race during the long yeah. dark. And then remember how we only have, we have some people that are partial souls incarnate on the planet. And we have others floating around in the bardo that can't cross over this frequency barrier. And they, those constantly recycle, recycle recycle and come back fragmented and more fragmented and more fragmented as we moved further and further into the law and dark and they were more exploited and more tortured and more fed off of so yeah there's a lot of past life and there's a lot of past life damage but we also have an awful lot of people on the planet right now because we've got what would have been in the light time one soul occupying probably numerous bodies Oh, so <laughs> yes, you just stepped into another very interesting aspect as well. Explain that. That's that's very interesting to me. Isn't that interesting? Yes. You know, I, I call it the Walmart syndrome. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I'm around people, but their their frequency is so low, they're so compromised, their health is so compromised. It looks like their eyes are dead and they just kind of walk like zombies. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens to us when we lose so much of our frequency that we're just kind of walking around in these bodies that we don't have connection with ourselves, we don't have connection with each other, and we're just total little in a, a, oblivious, really. And, I, and it seems to me, you know, and this is what I've seen and been shown in various times, is a lot of us are, well, all of us are not the whole beings that we had the opportunity of being in the light. It's just the way it is. But now a lot of us, a lot of those whole beings in the light had incarnated as various individuals on the planet at the same time, as well as having some of their parts floating around in the ethers, but unable to return to source. And so now's the time that starts to turn around, and what we're starting to see is this mass exodus we've been experiencing. Mm -hmm. It's people Mm -hmm. leaving. Okay, yes. people leaving, but a lot of them are leaving so that they can become available for the rest of them to reintegrate. To you got it. Okay, you got it. this is this is uh, you probably reframe something that I've suspected or known for a long time. I don't think I looked at it in quite that context that you just presented but it has to do with I guess what you would call multi, multiple aspects of our own selves which is um, so difficult to explain that I've actually tried to avoid talking about this but this is this is very interesting stuff isn't it amazing and that's why sometimes you'll see someone and you'll just feel a real attraction to them it's not a sexual attraction but it's like I know you well, we call it coming from the same soul body. And yet these are separate consciousnesses, but yes. operating from the same, what, prima materia? The yes. same soul, soul group? Um, yes. Help me with language, because my language fails me. Uh, it, when, well, I don't think we have language for it, but yes, it's like if we consider in the time of unity, the one that we're moving towards, and the one that was in Leo, that everything is moving so quickly that we approach unity. So what do we mean by moving so quickly is you are switching from positive to negative, positive to negative so rapidly as to almost have a unified experience. Now, we have to have a certain amount of polarization in order to be alive. All of our systems function on the base of attraction and repulsion, the way the cells move things in and out of them, everything, okay, including all the toroidal fields have to have a certain amount of polarity. Mm-hmm. When we're in a time of unity, 
we encompass a much larger band as an individual in a single body, a much larger band of frequency. Okay? Okay. You, like we just say, much larger, you know, higher octaves, lower octaves, just like in sound. Right, right. Okay, so as we start to go into that long dark, instead of being a single instrument, we start having to split into a symphony, if you will. So each person holds a particular aspect of the frequency. Some of it is so high that it can no longer be incarnate on the planet because right. the planet's moved into a polarized state. Right. Okay, so it's there, but it's, we're, it's, not, it's not interacting. And that's what sometimes we refer to as our higher selves. Aspects of ourselves that exist at a higher frequency. Yes, yes. Now, that's the natural order. But when we're working with a system that has become so exploitive, all these um, ritualistic abuses and all those nasty things we were talking about before, yes. intentionally fragment the souls further because just like fra splitting an atom, energy is released at the time of fragmentation to be exploited. And then also the part is uh, available to be tortured because it's not, no longer part of the whole. And we become extremely fragmented, more so than just the natural from our higher selves to unity and back to higher selves again as we move through the ages. And that's the situation we find ourselves in now, and that's what we're trying to heal. So if I understand you correctly... And first off, you mentioned a die-off, and this has been repeatedly talked about um, in some of the things that I've read over the years, and even my own understanding, because what we're talking about, I guess, is what you would call the end of days in the Bible, uh, the transition into this age, but there are these prophecies, predictions out there of souls who are just going to depart en masse from the planet. Is that occurring now? Is that something we're going to see accelerate as well as we go into this? Well, I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes it is. And I'm going to have to share something with you that I saw on a journey uh, that was around what's going on in these times. So um, our entire sun and solar system is moving into a higher frequency area that's affecting every planet and the sun itself. Frequency is raising for all the reasons we talked about. And the frequency of the planet herself is raising. Um, we have then on the other side, we have all this unbelievable fragmentation that was able to take place during the long dark, from the witch burnings to everything else. And um, continuing. <laughs> So we talked about some of these fragmented parts are incarnate in bodies, but some of them are trapped between that energy ceiling and physicality. As the frequency of the planet raises to a certain level, it breaks that energy barrier, energy ceiling, and these souls, the ones that aren't necessarily in bodies, can go to source. And it's like, so I see these things just flying off the planet when we get one of those waves where we get these high-frequency waves we were talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like I just see these, but it's not necessarily people in bodies dying, but rather souls that have been trapped here because of the frequency ceiling are being released. We also see more people dying than are being born for the first time in the United States for how, how long? Oh, yeah. So it's not just dying, it's just not coming back. So the cycle itself is actually kind of tightening like a spiral? Yes. Yeah, visually, you know, that's what I get, too. And, yeah, exactly. And um, it, it's... Well, <laughs> even for this show, some of the concepts we're talking about are really out there on the rim, but this multi-aspect of self is so interesting and yet so hard to describe and and describing it in the context of where we're at right now um, when I talked about the die-off I wasn't trying to be macabre about it it's just that, that that's an anticipation a lot of people predicted and talked about and it's been an expectation I think I think some of this is almost kind of hardwired into our collective consciousness as well what, do you see that as too? I mean, in 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 talking to people and in your research. 
Yes, I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of predictions about that, and I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. Um, and like I said, I think it's again just like past life. I don't, I think it's, um, I don't think we really understand exactly what that looks like, and that's why that vision I had in the journey was so telling to me that that it was not, you know, yes, people are more people are dying than are being born right now in a lot of places through choice, and more people that are coming in. Uh, look at these rainbow kids. Look at these crystal kids. The, because yeah, our yeah, the planet is in a higher frequency place right now, kids can come in with more on deck than they could before. And so the ones being born are more, more whole and carry a larger frequency range than a lot of the older ones dying. I kind of straddle two generations here, even in my own home. And what I notice is how extraordinary children are now. Um, some of them are extraordinarily fragmented. Some of them are an incredibly gifted. But there seem to be extremes. And I, I talk to friends that are educators, and they're perplexed. Um, do you deal with children at all? Do you have an opportunity to do practices with, with younger people? Yes, I sure have. I've practiced with a lot of younger people. In fact, we used to hold um, uh, junior training school, uh, shamanic training for the gifted young ones that were having trouble because they could they could see in the quantum level and they were having trouble existing in the matrix, if you will. So we used to work with those a lot. I work one-on-one with those kind of kids a lot. Um, but what I see, and this is kind of the best that I can describe it, is now that we're coming into a higher frequency time, people that have or, or beings that want to incarnate can bring more of themselves with them from outside of that frequency barrier and at the same time others are still being reborn from that are coming or recycling from within that frequency barrier so it's like we have these two almost different species yes if you will. that's that's exactly what i think i've been seeing and what a lot of people were talking about it's it's almost a it's like a dichotomy because you have incredibly gifted almost seemingly very together type people and at the same time you have the other side of the spectrum which is these uh well how long now have we been treating uh, attention deficit disorder i know it goes back to at least 12 years ago when one of my children was in middle school because they tried to treat him and so we've been trying to treat disorders of people who are exhibiting aspects again of their various personalities incarnating Exactly. So these blessed ones, of course, the system is going to try to put nice low-frequency chemicals and, and, and get them under the radar there, you know, because <laughs> they're a threat to the system. And, you know, I, I remember my son was uh, came in very gifted, and um, he was in second grade. He came home one day, and he says, Mom, I've decided I'm not going back to school. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> do tell, son. And he says, well, Mom... All they do is make you sit still all day, tell you lies, and expect you to memorize them. Well, I didn't have much I could say to that, except then we had to go into the discussion, well, they'll arrest your mommy if you don't go to school. Because <laughs> <laughs> I sure couldn't argue with his assessment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that seems to be an issue. We've done it all. We've sent our kids to school and we've homeschooled them, and uh, every child's different. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with the kids going to school. It's just that um, the, the really gifted ones are a challenge to the system. And so the, 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 the method in the past from very well-meaning teachers and doctors has been to medicate them. But I think now that there's more and more and more of them around, we're recognizing, oh, <laughs> this isn't, this isn't uh, a disorder. <laughs> this is a new order. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of the a lot of the kids that have come in this time uh, would be in the spectrum of anything from ADD up to autism and everything in between. Exactly. Uh, that is an interesting issue as well. Autism. Have you uh, dealt with that? Outside of being one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, I think I'm there's pretty... an aspect to all of us that's somewhat autistic. That may so. actually be a good thing. <laughs> well, it is. It's just you have to be able to come and go as you wish rather yeah. than get stuck yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I have worked with, with autistic children. They respond really well to drumming. Um, in one of the jump start programs, I used to hold drumming circles. And those little boogers that climb underneath the big drum just to feel it. It was amazing to watch because it grounded them and it helped them, you know, connect with the earth rhythms 
I would think in general this would be something ideal for children to learn to reconnect them because you know we're talking of shamanism at its most basic level as I understand it is connected to the natural rhythms and cycles of the planet itself it goes beyond that obviously but taking young children and getting them connected early seems like we would be building on the practice and again one of those waves moving out to advance the hundredth monkey syndrome You've got it. So that way the children have a recourse, they have a place to ground so that they don't have to fragment even though the system's in trouble and uh, and they can retain more of their natural expression rather than lose it. And like you say, there's another way of going out rather than fragmenting into the system and then trying to heal back out of it. I get a couple of questions on the chat room. And again, if anybody wants to call in right now, it's perfect time. Uh, we're bumping up on the on the end of the second hour, but I'm going to take the last question first. <clears throat> it transitions a little bit better, but basically it says um, they don't understand what you mean by raising the frequency to get good health. The person says, "I get that this is bandwidth, but so much of what the guest describes as health is simplified as high frequency. What is it? How do we know it is high?" I hope that makes sense hmm. let me let me sit with that one a little bit okay okay <laughs> yeah I didn't, i'll get there just a second i'm trying to figure out what she's asking he she it's a he i believe yes okay it's red on the chat um, okay so um the more expansive frequency is really what i'm talking about not just high but high and low um so in, in other words, if I'm a vocalist and I can only sing uh, a few notes, I can't sing very complicated songs. Right. So my expression is very limited. But if I have a higher range between my highest note and my lowest note, I can encompass much more song. It's the same way with every aspect of our beings. If our bodies have more mobility and less restriction, they can operate at their optimum. And that's what I'm talking about in frequency. And it operates that, that same concept, operates physical, mental, emotional, and spiritually. So by high frequency, I don't just mean higher and higher. I really mean more expansive. And it goes back to Einstein saying that reality is frequency match the frequency of the reality you want and you can't help but get that reality so if we have more expansive frequency on all four of our levels and the reality we want is one of health and prosperity that's what we can create right when you were describing that before I pictured it sort of as the Merkaba uh, the yeah. pyramids on both ends and yes. the energies themselves uh Contain, contain both down and upward at the apex of the of the of the triangle. Exactly. Yes. So we're, and that's, we're modulating. Isn't that really kind of a good way to put it? We're kind of modulating the frequencies. It's not high or low. It's bringing all of that together in balance. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, it's Red. I, Red. I hope I, I hope that answers your question. And go ahead and post if. Uh, if you have additional questions. The other question had to do with something we talked about earlier. Can we do anything to assist the trapped souls? Yes. Um, um, shamanically speaking, practitioners can do a lot to assist that. But as individuals, if we move through our own healing process and obtain more expansive frequency, when the 100th when the monkey, if you will, or, or the, the, the critical mass is struck, the ceiling goes away. We have transcended the, the ceiling of frequency. It's not a barrier. It's simply everybody's been um, fragmented to where nobody can get past that. If some of us start getting past that ceiling by turning around the, the programming and the damage as individuals, the more of us that do that, the more the wave moves out and the souls are freed. That's moving in conjunction with the high frequency that's coming in from the galactic um, influences that we talked about earlier in the show. So we're like working it from both ends, which takes us back to that formula that says for one result, it takes two causalities, one from the past and one from the future, one from matter, one from antimatter. So the frequencies coming in towards the planet from the galaxy are from the future, and us moving, reclaiming our birthright as our frequency here on the planet is reclaiming from the past, and that will create the release. 
That was actually a very nice nutshell description of everything we have talked about for almost two hours tonight. <laughs> um, beautiful. I love when somebody can do a segue that deftly. Um, that's like being a cerebral disc jockey. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm looking to see if there's any more questions or if anybody wants to call in. If not, we're probably going to wrap this up. You guys on the chat room tonight have rocked. Um, good questions, good energy. Um, so, go to here in the last few minutes. You know, I was on your Amazon page and I noticed the incredible amount of material that you've produced. It looks like a lot of it is aimed at training people as well. Um, tell people a little bit about your, your, your books and your training courses and, and the other things that you're involved with. Sure, Randy. Um, I'm the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Art School, and we train and certify shamanic practitioners and teachers. We're now starting to offer uh, online courses for the first block of training, and then we're going to offer the training in blocks so that people can come for a seven-day retreat and take a block of courses. Then they have uh, correspondence support from our certified teachers, and I teach them the block classes. So we're getting to where we can work internationally that way. We also have uh, certified long-distance shamanic practitioners that are available um, to help people with soul retrieval long distance. We work on the phone and make recordings of the sessions. Um, it's very supportive and uh, well-rounded. And um, then, of course, I've written my latest book, is So We're Still Here Now What? Spiritual Evolution and Personal Empowerment in a New Era. That was published by Swan Raven and Company. And then I have workbooks out there on Amazon. I'm also a singer-songwriter, and my group is called Starfire. And our latest CD released is um, uh, Winds of Time, and it's also available on Amazon or on my website. I should have asked you to send me some music. We would have played it on the break tonight. Oh, well, we'll just have to do this again, and I'll send you some. We will. We will do that completely. Um, I have one follow-up. It seems like maybe we're a little stuck here. Um, Follow-up question on that one. If we do help trap souls pass on or escape, would we be inviting a backlash by the negative energies that we helped escape? Um. Oh, I see. I see the question, yeah. Uh, the beauty of this is the time of those negative energies being able to rule is, is passing. And as the, the time comes, when the seventh trumpet is sounded, if you will, or the seventh tone, when that ceiling can be released, they no longer can rule there because they've lost control completely. So, no, we're just moving into a new era, and there's a different rule, set of rules in the new era, and the old way will pass. And for Rhett, I I know you had a follow-up here uh, talking about Raise Your Vibration, a New Age Mantra. I think if you go back and replay the archive on the show, um, somewhere in this group of thoughts and ideas tonight, uh, this was explained. It is not the same thing as raising your vibration. Is is that correct, Guada? Yes, it is. Uh, frequency, everything expresses according to frequency, like Einstein said. So I'm talking about at the quantum level, not uh, good vibrations. <laughs> and you might want to get the book, too. That would probably help a lot. Yeah, it, it really steps it out. It's, it's a very complicated um, concept, but it, it really lines up with physics, and it's easily described in the book. It's just kind of hard to verbalize it. Absolutely. I think we've had a very fascinating con uh, uh, series of conversations here tonight, Quota. And uh, I look forward to uh, having you back again at some point because it looks like once we, once we got past the initial, there was a, a lot of interest here. Um, and again, <laughs> sorry guys, I got to close this show out at some point, but I'll stay on the chat after the show if you if you want. Um, next week, you want to join us um, because it's going to be a, a, a very interesting show. My co-host next week is Chris Holly, special guest Ken Pfeiffer of WorldUFOPhotos.org. That's going to close it out for tonight. This is Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it. We'll be back next week. Mm-hmm.